The first speaker that you're going to be hearing from today is a new good friend of mine named Matt Lloyd. Now, Matt has been one of our top affiliates, one of our top affiliates, in several of the last biggest product launches that we've promoted. And because I saw him showing up on the scene, actually the first time I ever saw Matt Lloyd, anything from Matt, was a Facebook ad that he was doing for Get Traffic 3.0. And it was damn good. And I clicked on it, and I read the copy, and I saw his bonus packages and how he put everything together, and I said to myself, this is a really good marketer. And so over the course of a few months, I ended up building a relationship with Matt. And over the last few months, Matt and I have actually been partnered up and working on a lot of different projects together. And so one of the things that we've been working on is really Facebook advertising. And if you've seen pretty much any of my ads on Facebook over the last few months, I've had a few. Have you guys noticed that? <laughs> that was all Matt Lloyd pretty much behind the scene, taking care of all that, managing all that building out those campaigns, those strategies, driving that traffic. And we've also been working on a couple other things. Matt is one of the people who has um, really developed the technology that I'm going to be sharing with you later on today. He's the one who really helped us set it up in our business on a whole new level, and it's kind of how we figured out and I don't want to let the whole cat out of the bag, it's kind of how we figured out this new sales process that I believe is the future of really selling any sort of big decision item online. So if it's a more difficult decision and people need a little bit more time to be educated, to be researched, this process that we're going to share with you is the exact future of how to do it. And when you see this whole thing laid out, it's going to blow your mind. I mean, it's just, it is rad. And so Matt was instrumental in us setting this up in our company in the last 90 days. So I'm extremely excited for the rest of your day here. So with that being said, I'd like you guys to put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Mr. Matt Lloyd. Do your thing, my friend. You are absolutely awesome, and okay. see you guys in 90 minutes. <clears throat> Whoa. So, hi everyone, as Jonathan said, my name is Matt Lloyd, and I do have a confession. I've actually never done one of these before, so for the past yeah, three weeks I've been putting in a lot of effort into this because what I want to talk about, it's possibly more important to your future online than anything else. And these are things that have taken me maybe three years to fully understand. So if you're just getting started, what I'm going to share with you today, you really want to pay attention to it. It's really important. So here's what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to be sharing with you the, the real truth about traffic. Okay, and why you're not getting as much as you'd possibly like and what to do about it. Okay, I'm going to approach traffic from an entirely different angle than you've ever heard before. Plus, I'm going to talk a little bit about Facebook pay-per-click training. I'm going to give you some advice that I wish I had got in the very beginning. It's going to shorten that learning curve a little bit. So let's go ahead and get started. I want to tell you a story first. As you can see, this is a guy called Samuel Langley. Okay, and if we go back to the year 1903, Samuel Langley, he wanted to be the first guy to ever fly, okay? So he wanted to be the first guy to ever fly an aircraft manned by, you know, manned by him and be able to land it. And around this time period, there was sort of a race on to be the first person to do that. And US Congress, they actually backed Samuel Langley and they gave him $50,000. In today's terms, that's over a million dollars. So it was a lot of money back then. Okay, and Samuel Langley, he invested most of that money. He hired his own team of around 50 people. He invested a lot of that money into developing an engine for this aircraft. 
October 7th, 1903, they were ready to launch this plane. Okay, so they'd put a lot of work into planning it, building it. They were ready to do it. They launched it off a side of a boat, and this is basically what happened. You can see a photo there. Bottom right side, it crashed. Okay? Langley decided to try again. So December the 8th, they poured even more money into it. They redid this plane. And again, this time it crashed again. Now, this, you know, this pretty much ended Langley's whole uh, pursuit of being the first person on the flight. They had invested a lot of money into it. US Congress at the time decided, you know, we don't want to invest any more into this because this just is not going to happen. Now, nine days after Langley's big crash, after he gave up, a sturdy, well-designed aircraft, only costing about $1,000 US, uh, struggled into air in Kitty Hawk. Most of you will know the story. And that actually became the first aircraft to ever fly. The people behind that were the Wright brothers. So I'm sure you've all heard of the Wright brothers. Uh, the Wright brothers, these were guys who had wanted to fly ever since they were about nine years old. Okay, so it had always been a big dream of theirs. The Wright brothers, nine days after, they succeeded. Now, what you've got to realise is that they, they created a lot of aircraft, like something like 47. Most of them crashed. Okay, but finally they succeeded. Now, once their approach was a little bit different to Langley. Once and only once, they had built that aircraft that could actually glide, okay, so they could virtually launch it off the top of a hill and it would glide down to the ground. Once and only once they'd done that, then they thought about the power. Okay, and it only flew for about 12 seconds, so it wasn't exactly a long time, but, you know, they were the first guys to ever do it. And so what happened? Everyone's heard of the Wright brothers. Most of you would have heard of the Wright brothers. No one's heard of Langley. Okay, Langley, he actually died a very bitter and disappointed man uh, because, you know, they'd invested a lot of money behind him and he hadn't succeeded. So the question is, why did the Wright brothers succeed and Langley not? Okay, one historian put it like this. I want you to, to pay attention to this. Langley had spent most of four years building an extraordinary engine to lift their heavy flying machine. The Wrights had spent most of four years building a flying machine so artfully designed that it could be propelled into the air by a fairly ordinary internal combustion engine. So the Wright brothers, their approach was to make this aircraft that could actually fly before they thought, even thought about adding power. Now, you might be wondering, why, why am I telling you this? You know, why am I giving you a history lesson? What's it got to do with my business? And the answer is, this has everything to do with your business. Everything. Facebook pay-per-click, which I'm going to touch on today, it's, it's virtually like the engine okay, that you would put on an aircraft. And it can send you a lot of traffic. So if you wanted to, if you were prepared to pay for it, you could get 10,000 clicks or 10,000 people in front of your website by next week, if you wanted to. If you were willing to pay for those clicks, you could get that amount of traffic. You could possibly get a lot more. Okay, now your website, on the other hand, that's like the aircraft structure. Depending on how well you design that, it's either going to fly, maybe half fly, or just crash and burn. And when I say, will it fly, what I'm talking about is, will it convert visitors into customers? Okay, that's the question. Now, if you have a website and it can't fly or it can't convert visitors into sales, it doesn't matter how much power you add to it. It doesn't matter if you get 10,000 clicks, it's still going to crash. And yet that's what most people do. They have a, a substandard website. They go chasing traffic as if that's the answer when that traffic has no chance of converting. Okay, that's what, when I say most people, I'm talking about literally 98% of people in our industry. The biggest mistake that people make when coming into this industry, and if you want to, if you're brand new, pay extra attention to this, the biggest mistake is thinking about traffic like an opportunity seeker. Most people think like that. They go and design a blog, and it's a substandard blog when it comes to converting visitors into sales, and then they think the answer to making money online is to go and get more traffic. 
because they've been taught that more traffic equals more money. It's one of the most damaging beliefs in this industry. And although it's somewhat true, it's only true if your sales and marketing process can convert that traffic into sales. So if you've been getting, let's say you've only been getting 15 unique visitors to your website for the past day, and uh, you've been doing that for the past 10 weeks, if you haven't got sales yet, the problem is not a lack of traffic. The problem is your aircraft. It's your website. It can't convert uh, visitors into sales. When it comes to making money online, this is the equation. It's traffic plus conversions equals sales. All right? Traffic plus conversions equals sales. And most people completely forget about the conversion part. Okay? Or they, they think it's not really that important. And when you make that mistake, when you think it's all about the engine of the aircraft that's going to make it fly, or you think it's all about traffic, this is what happens. All right? Your website it's going to crash and burn, just like Langley's did. So if you've been doing this for years and you haven't yet got results, I'll bet that this is the main reason. Okay, you're trying to send traffic to a substandard website that just cannot convert traffic or unique visitors into sales at an adequate rate. Okay? What most people fail to realise is that even, you know, even if you have this website, even if you were to get 1,000 or 10,000 clicks by tomorrow, it wouldn't really matter because you can't convert that traffic into sales. And you might get the odd sale, but you've got to remember that all traffic has a cost. All traffic has a cost. And I want to end a myth that a lot of people perpetuate in this industry right now. There is no such thing as free traffic. So when you hear gurus telling you about how you can get free traffic, it's complete rubbish. Okay, there's no such thing. All traffic has a cost. Even SEO or article marketing, they have a cost. Okay, and the cost might not necessarily be money, it's time. So if you, if you want to do something like article spinning, you might think, well, that's free. I create an article, I put it into an article spinner, I get 10,000 unique articles by tomorrow. What you've got to realize is that most of those articles are crap. You can't even read them. Okay, and why would you want to have that associated with your brand? Okay, that's actually going to do damage to your brand. People read that and they see that you're behind it and it doesn't look good. So all traffic has a cost. See the time or money behind it. There's no such thing as free traffic. So if you're going to go out there and, you know, seek traffic and spend money on traffic, which you always do in the form of time or money, doesn't it make sense for you to, to think like the Wright brothers and design this aircraft first before you even think about adding power to it? Doesn't it make sense to build a website that at least has a chance of converting visitors into sales before you go and add traffic? I want to give you an example. You've all heard of the dot-com bust, right? Back in the, the early 2000s, there was a company called Pets.com and it wasn't around for very long. Now, Pets.com... They, they thought, like most people in this industry do, that traffic equals sales. So they went and spent a fortune on advertising. For example, at the, the Super Bowl, they got ads for the Super Bowl, spent millions of dollars for a 30-second ad slot. And what happened? They were spending $270 to get a customer, right? And they could only monetize customers for about $75. So you can see that if you pay $270 to get a customer and they're only worth $70 to you, you're going to go broke pretty quickly. Uh, something like $300 million was invested into that company and all of it was lost okay, because they were thinking the wrong way. So the question, I want you to, to remember this and perhaps write this down. The question is not, how do I get more traffic? The question you should be asking is, how do I make more profitable sales? All right? It's not about getting more traffic, it's about making more profitable sales. So you start off, like I said, building that structure can, that can actually fly, like the Wright brothers did. Once you get it so it can actually glide, then you go and add the power. Then you go and add traffic. Now, I'm talking a lot about, you know, you get it so it can fly, and you might be wondering, well, what exactly does that mean? All right? And I'm talking about how well it converts. And there is one number in your business that is more important than any other number. Okay, it's more, way more important. And that number will tell you how well your website can actually fly. 
And I'll guarantee you that 97% of people in our industry, probably more, have no clue what that number is. Okay, and that number is your average visitor value. It's more important than anything else. It's more important than unique visitors. It's more important than average time on site, average page views. All of these numbers pale in comparison next to average visitor value. Now, if you've never heard of average visitor value, here's what it is. Average visitor value tells you how much a click is worth to your business. It's the maximum you can afford to pay to get someone in front of your website before you start well, to break even, before you start losing money. Okay? And unless you know these values or this number, you cannot make informed traffic buying decisions. Okay, so any traffic that you go and buy, even the so-called free strategies, which aren't really free, any traffic that you go and buy will be based on hope. Okay, you'll be spending time or money getting traffic and you will be hoping that it makes you money and you cannot build a business based on hope. Okay, it doesn't work like that. So average vista value, if you want to write this down, this is how it works. Take your gross sales. Okay, so let's say we sell 10 units in a day and let's say that each sale we make is worth $100. So our gross sales for the day is $1,000. Divide that by the unique visitors to your website. Let's say in that day we had 1,000 people in front of our website. That's going to give you your average visitor value. $1,000 divided by 1,000 unique visitors gives you $1 per visitor. On average, that is what a visitor is worth to your business. And that means that you can afford up to a dollar to get someone in front of your website before you start losing money. And yet, like I said, most people in our industry, they have no idea what it means. It tells you how well your aircraft can fly. That's what it tells you before you go and add power. And I want to prove it to you. I want everyone in this room to be completely honest with me. If you can tell me what your average visitor value is, right down to the nearest cent, okay, an accurate number. If you can tell me what it is right now, please put up your hand. All right, Leo. So there's about 150 people in this room and we had one person put up their hand. Okay, so literally in this room, 99% of people don't know what it is. Now this, this room is not exactly representative of the entire internet marketing community. You guys are gonna be much better than the average person because the fact that you're here, you're willing to invest your money and time to get here, means that this sample is, you know, it's a much better sample than your average internet marketer. So what that tells us is that maybe if you go to the general internet marketing community, something like over 99% of people have no idea what this number is, the most important number in your business. And here's a quote by Rich Sheffron. Uh, Rich has influenced a lot of what I do. Uh, a question? You're asking me, is break even okay? Yeah, yeah break even is good. Anytime you break even, so if you have to spend a dollar to get someone in front of your website and you only monetize that visitor by one dollar, that's you celebrate because even though you'd made no profit at that point in time, you've got a customer. You've just brought yourself a customer. And that's what this business is really about, buying customers. Because you've got to look at the lifetime value of a customer. So if you've just spent a dollar, you've got someone in front of your website, they buy a product, you made a dollar back, all right? Well, sure, you haven't made any profit right then in that point in time, but over the next maybe three years, you can sell them lots of additional products. So if you have to spend a dollar to get someone in front of your website, you know, that's perfectly fine. I want to further drive this point home, okay? I want, to, I want you to imagine a scenario, right? Let's pretend that I, I finish my presentation and, you know, you're really thirsty and you feel like a Coke, All right? So you go out and you look for a vending machine to buy a can of Coke for $2. You find a vending machine and you put in $2. Instead of hearing the Coke, you hear change, okay? All right, you think, all right, what's going on here? You put in your hand and you bring out a dollar eighty in coins. So you're a little bit annoyed. The machine has just ate 20 cents of your money. But you find a cheaper drink and you put in your $1.80 again 
Except this time again, you get change. And this time it gives you back $1.60. So now you're getting a little bit more annoyed. You find another, uh, another drink for $1.60. You put in that change. This time it gives you back $1.55. This vending machine is eating 10% of the money you put in. So for every dollar you put in, it gives you 90 cents back. Okay, my question to you is, how long could you stand in front of that vending machine putting money into it before you went broke? Okay, and the answer is not very long. Actually, the, you know, the mathematical answer is you could stand there for you know, infinity because the, the amounts would get smaller and smaller, but practically, you'd be out of money pretty quickly. You'd be down to like 10 or 5 cents. So you couldn't stand there for that long. Imagine another scenario. Let's say you didn't go to that vending machine. You went to one upstairs. And this one was also $2 per can of Coke. So you put in $2. You put in $2, except this time it gives you back $2.20. So you think, all right, well, maybe someone left 20 cents there, but I'm happy. You put in $2.20, you order a more expensive drink, except this time it gives you back $2.40. Now you're getting pretty excited. All right, so you do it again. And this time it gives you back $2.60. Now you're thinking, or $2.65, now you're thinking, all right, this is good. This vending machine is giving you 10% more back than, you what, than what you put in. Now my question to you is, how long could you stand in front of this vending machine putting money into it? Yeah, forever, and you would, you'd be crazy not to stand there and keep on putting money into it. Uh, let's put honesty aside and uh, you could stand there forever and you would get very, very rich doing that because once compound interest uh, kicked in, you'd start basically printing money. Your website is either one of these two vending machines right now. The money you are putting into that vending machine is like the money you are spending on traffic and as I said, all traffic has a cost. So even if you think you're doing you know, free traffic strategies like SEO and you think it's free, it's not. There's a cost, okay, because your time has value. So right now you are putting money into that vending machine and you're getting money back. The money you get out of that vending machine is like your average visitor value. And what you guys have just told me is that most of you don't know what you're getting in return. So the situation is you're putting money into a vending machine and you don't really know how much change it's giving you. Now, if I, if I put you in front of a faulty vending machine and I said, hey, keep putting money into this, but I'm not going to tell you how much it's going to give you back in return, how long would you do that for? Right? You wouldn't do it for that long because you'd be crazy. You'd, you'd want to know what you're getting back in return. And as you just saw, most people in this industry don't even know what they're getting in return. So most people, in effect, they're standing in front of a vending machine, putting money into it and hoping they make a profit. This is what you're aiming for. This is what I call the holy grail. So everything you do in your day-to-day -day operations is to get to this point. It's to get to the point where your average visitor value is greater than your average cost per click. What that means is you found a vending machine where when you put in money, you get more back in return. And once you get to this level, then you can scale up. So every millionaire in our industry, this is where they're at. They spend money on traffic. They spend 90 cents on a click. And their average visitor value is a dollar. They make a profit. They can afford to reinvest that. Whereas most people are making a lot less than what they're putting in. That's why they can't grow. Okay? Now, you might be wondering, well, what if I'm brand new and I don't yet have my own marketing funnel? And the truth is, if you knew, at some point, you do want to create your own product. It's not really an option, it's a must. So at some point, you do have to craft your own marketing funnel. And in the beginning, you're actually in a race against time. You see, when, we, when most of us get started, we only have, uh, you know, usually a pretty small budget we can put into advertising. You're in a race to, to uh, fine-tune your aircraft, to fine-tune your website to the point where your average vista value exceeds your average cost per click before you run out of money. And I know what that's like. Uh, 2009, when I was still pretty new, I was advertising on Google AdWords before it completely kicked us off. And I remember 
racking up a bill of about $1,500 and I couldn't afford to pay it because my average Vista value wasn't that high so I wasn't getting any money in return. And I can remember, you know, Google virtually coming after me, sending me legal letters and for like three months saying, you better pay up. Okay, so I know what that's like. And if you're just getting started, that's the situation you're in. You've got to fine tune your website to the point where average visa value equals or is greater than average cost per click. Okay? When you start out, expect to put more money into that vending machine than you get back. That's perfectly normal because you're still figuring out what works. But as long as you're measuring, then you can at least have a chance of improving it. Okay? And most people, because they're not measuring, they go and spend, say, $200 on Facebook pay per click ads, and they don't make that money back, and they think, okay, well, Facebook doesn't work. And they give up. That's what most people do, because they, they're not even measuring it. Okay, so I've told you how important this is, and now you might be wondering, okay, well, that's great. How do I improve it? The first step, okay, the most important step is to start measuring. The mere act of measuring something every single day will allow you to improve because, you know, as they say, what gets measured gets managed. Now, as we saw, most people aren't measuring this, but if you start measuring this every single day from this point on, I guarantee you that over time it will improve because, as I said, this is the most important number in your business. If you're measuring it every day, consistently working on improving it, that's how you're going to grow your business. So the first thing I want you to do, it's a little bit hard for you guys to see this. Let me just read this out. Uh, on the left, you have the date that every single day we record this. This is, you can either do this in Excel or Google Docs. Okay, I prefer Google Docs because then I can share it with a virtual assistant and they can put the numbers in. I don't have to worry about it. But you can see in the left column, we've got new customers since yesterday. So the number of customers you're getting every day. Then we've got total customers. We've got new leads since yesterday, so daily leads, total number of leads, total sales generated, today's sales, so that's your gross sales you made in the last 24 hours, and today's clicks. Because you're measuring, now you're going to know how many clicks you're, you're getting to your website. You take those sales for today, divide them by today's clicks, that's going to give you your average Vista value. Now, as you can see, for this particular website, it's ranging from about $1.20 to about $4.22. Now, what's going to happen is, if we keep on doing this for a month, we're going to start to notice there's an average here. Now, you can see here, it's something like $2.94. That's telling us every Vista we get in front of our website is worth about $2.29 to our business. But if you're not measuring, you have no idea what this number is. And then this is really important. Once you get your average Vista value every single day, because now you're measuring, plot it in a graph. This is one of the most uh, you know, exciting developments in the history of humankind, the ability to display data over a period of time, the visual representation of data. It really is, because then you can see the trends. Now, this is only over, say, 10 days, so you can't really see much of a trend here, but if we extended this to about 30 days, you would start to notice that the average Vista value, which is on the, the y-axis, the, the part sticking up, you can see it's, it's fluctuating around anywhere from 2 to or 3 to $4. Now, over 30 days, we would be able to see a more consistent pattern. And this is really important because over time, you're going to notice whether you're trending up or you're trending down. That means visitors are becoming more and more valuable to your website over time or less. And let me tell you something. Your business, it's either growing or it's declining. It never stays in the same place. Because even if you're not making any changes, the market around you is changing. Okay, there's new people coming into this industry, new products, so it's always changing. You're, even, you're, you're either getting better or you're getting worse. And unless you're measuring this, you have no idea. Okay? So now I want to show you how you can increase your average Vista value by 60% just by improving five leverage points in your business. 
This is basically the formula to you making money online. It's leads times conversion rate. So if you get 100 leads in a day and you have a conversion rate of 3%, that means that three of those 100 leads buy. That's going to equal your customers. Okay? Frequency of transactions, how often they buy from you in the next year, times your average transaction sale. Let's say you're selling a $97 product and you have a few upsells in there. On average, a customer is worth $250 to your business. Okay, that's going to be your average transaction value. That's going to give you total revenue. Multiply that by your margins. Now, most of us in the information marketing business, our margins are 100%. We create a product and we get to keep all of it, okay? So it doesn't really apply, but if you're promoting an affiliate offer, well then, sure, you might, you know, if you're, let's say you're promoting Jonathan's products, you get paid a 50% margin. You refer a sale to him and he pays you 50%. Now, this is what you can do. If you take those five leverage points and you increase them by just 10%, which isn't a big amount, say you're getting 100 leads, you increase that to 110 Say you get a conversion rate of 3%. That means 3 in 100 leads buy. You increase that by 3.3, just 10%. Frequency of transactions, average transaction size, so on. These five points, if you increase each by only 10%, you actually increase your profit by 60%. If you go through and you do the math, it sort of compounds on itself. So small incremental changes can virtually almost double your business. Okay, so you only have to increase each by 10%. It's not a huge amount. Now, you might be saying, I know there's always people who just say things like, well, I'm not good with numbers. I don't really know how to do that stuff. I'm just not good with that. The truth is, if you are, if you are going to market online and get traffic, even if you're using the so-called free strategies, which aren't free because they take up your time, you need to get comfortable around these numbers. You need to be able to measure them. Because if you put it this way, if you know how to track your numbers, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get rich in this business. It doesn't give you an advantage. But if you don't know how to do it, that puts you at a big disadvantage because you are competing against people like me, Jonathan, uh, you know, Mike Dillard, whatever, all of those sort of guys, they all know their numbers and you're competing against those people. So what you've got to realise is that Personally, I'm going to be constantly fine-tuning my aircraft, making it more and more aerodynamic so it can fly better. So when I add power to it, it flies even better. I'm going to keep on doing that. And if you're not doing that, well then, that's going to be a little bit tough. Okay? It's going to be a little bit tough for you to, to grow a business. So you have to be doing this. And like I say here, anyone who's ever made over a million dollars in this business, I guarantee you, they're watching their numbers closely. Okay, so if you're not watching your numbers right now, you've got to turn this into a habit where you're doing it every single day. And I put here, generally speaking, the more money they make, the more meticulous they are about their numbers. Uh, I've been working with Jonathan for, I don't know, like five months now. So we, we email each other back and forth because I'm doing his, a lot of his Facebook pay-per-click campaigns. And I've noticed that you know, he's, he's always in the numbers and he wants to know what are we doing to improve numbers. He's always asking me that constantly, right? And you wonder, well, how did he sell over 12 million online so far? Well, that gives you a pretty big clue. Now, you can see, there's a, a photo of me. I'm going to explain that. In any industry, the business that is most efficient at extracting value from its resources, from its resources will usually win. Now, as online entrepreneurs, our resource is traffic. That's what we're extracting value from. So if we get traffic to our website, we're converting that into sales. So in our business, the business that has the highest average visitor value will win. Okay? They will get the lion's share of the money to be made in this industry. I want to give you an example. I grew up on a small uh, wheat farm in Western Australia, and the local town, this is kind of like the outback, I guess you'd call it. Not, not really, but it's in the country. The local town had a, it was a very small town. I went to the primary school there, and when I was like seven, the population of that school reached an all-time high. 
it reached 52 students. Okay, business was booming. Now, a few years later, uh, after I'd left that primary school and I went off to boarding school because we didn't have high schools in the town, uh, like two years after I left, the school shut down because they got down to just two students and three teachers. Okay, and obviously that wasn't going to work for very long. So the school shut down, and now that town, it's virtually a ghost town. There's about 15 people in the town that I live about five miles out of. It's a ghost town. Now, what actually happened is the reason why the population reached a boom of 52 students was because all the local farmers in the area, you know, there were quite a few of them, and they all had kids. But over time, what happened is the bigger farmers in the area started buying up land and pushing the smaller farmers out. Smaller farmers couldn't survive because economies of scale. They couldn't, they couldn't compete. So they had to sell up and go to the city. Over time, the big farmers got bigger and bigger and bigger. So the population of kids going to that school got smaller and smaller. And the motto became, get big or get out. You either had to expand or you wouldn't survive. And the automotive industry too. If you go back to the 19... Since the 1900s, if you look in the US history, there's been over 2,000 automotive companies. So over 2,000 car companies have started up since 1900. How many survive today? There's less than about 10. All right? There's a very small handful of big companies that survive. Over 2,000 companies have virtually gone out of business. That's the way it is in any industry. Okay? Usually a lot of people flood in to the industry and the businesses that are most efficient at extracting value, they go on to, su to succeed and the rest usually don't. Like I said, as an online entrepreneur, right now your resource is traffic. And whether you're going to be here in five or ten years or not will come down to how well you are able to extract value from that traffic, how high your average Vista value is. Okay? So that's why I'm really going on about average Vista value. It's, it's everything in your business. It really is. Reason is... You know, if, if you can't afford to spend more to get traffic than your competitors, you know, they, they can. And what ends up happening is that the websites that have the highest average Vista value, they get the lion's share of the traffic because traffic usually flows to the websites that are most efficient at extracting its value. I'll give you an example. Most of you would have heard of Mike Dillard, Magnetic Sponsoring. Did you know that they get around... 200 to 300 leads every single day. And their leads come from affiliates. So affiliates, like me and many of you, will send them traffic because the reason why we do it is because that traffic usually converts. They fine-tune their processes, so any traffic we send, it has a high average Vista value. So if they were to stop getting traffic... Right now, they would continue getting 200 to 300 leads every single day without even trying. So if you can get a higher average Vista value than anyone else, simply create an affiliate program, and affiliates like me will happily send you our traffic because that, you know, you're, you're going to pay us back. But you'll never get to that stage unless you can work on this number. Now, buying traffic, what... Let's, let's start to transition into actually buying traffic and then Facebook pay per click. What makes some traffic more valuable than others? Two things, volume of traffic and quantity of traffic. It has a lot to do with responsiveness. If you've ever heard that term thrown around before, you know, how responsive is a prospect, responsiveness is a measure of how often that audience thinks about your particular topic. So, for example, I am a very responsive lead for a marketing course because I think about marketing 24-7, all day, all night. It's really all I think about. I'm thinking about it a lot. Now, most of the people in this room, most of you are thinking about entrepreneurship, marketing, those things too. A lot of you think about it, you know, some less, some more than me. So this room as a whole is a very responsive audience for any marketing training. More importantly is past behavior, whether it's a buyer or a non-buyer. 
Okay, so for example, if you gave me a choice between marketing to 100 people, marketing a Facebook pay-per-click coaching program to 100 people who brought other Facebook pay-per-click training programs before, so that's one choice, or marketing to 2,000 people who are mildly interested, I would take them 100 people every single time because they have proven responsiveness. They, they are proven bias. They brought other courses related to mine. On average, a buyer, a buyer lead, is worth something like nine times more than a generic lead. So if you can market to proven buyers who brought you know, products like what you're offering, you're going to get a much higher response. I'll give you an example. Many of you would have heard of the company called Groupon, the website. Google recently made a bid for $6.5 billion to buy that company. Why were, they, why were they willing to pay that amount of money? $6.5 billion for a company that's it's pretty brand new. It hasn't been around for that long. And the truth is, quality of traffic. You see, Groupon, if you don't know it, it's basically a site where you go and get deals. But all the traffic that Groupon gets, that's the highest grade traffic you can get. People only go to Groupon to look for deals. In other words, they go to Groupon with a credit card in hand looking to spend money. Now that's quality traffic. That's why Google is willing to pay so much money for Groupon. Now unfortunately, there is an inverse relationship between targeted traffic and quantity. So for example, the more targeted traffic you get, the smaller group of people you're going to be marketing to. So if you can create an offer that's able to reach out to the less targeted leads or less targeted traffic and is able to convert that traffic into sales, that's how you build you know, a fairly big business. If you look at the most successful online businesses, that's what they're able to do. Now, I want to point something out. Buying traffic, virtually it's buying clicks, and what you have to realize is that not all clicks are equal. And this, again, this is one of the most sort of damaging beliefs in our industry. It's the idea that all clicks are equal, and they're, they're really not. So in some cases, $2 clicks, people clicking on your ads and costing you $2, will be worth more to your business than 10 cent clicks. And the reason is based on how well they convert. I want to give you an example. There's 150 people in this room, approximately. Let's say I got in a car and I went down to, uh, to downtown San Diego and I rounded up 150 strangers off the street and I brought them here in a bus and I put them in a room next door. Now, if I were to deliver, to deliver a sales presentation on a Facebook coaching program to you guys and then I was to go into that next room and do the exact same thing, what do you think would happen? In this room, I, I haven't really sold on stage before, so I don't know if I'd be that great at it. I've sold on webinars before, but I'm sure I could get maybe 10%, possibly a lot more, right? But if I went to that room and I did the exact same thing, I might be lucky to get, you know, 2% or less. It's a much less responsive crowd because, for one, you guys, let's be honest, are proven buyers. You're just like me. The fact that you're here now, you are willing to invest more money to come from, to this event from Unstoppable Entrepreneur, we all are proven buyers. Whereas that crowd, they're not. You know, they're just randomly chosen off the street. And also, you guys are much more responsive. You're a little bit like me. You think about this stuff a lot more. Whereas that random crowd, they, they don't think about this stuff. They think about what they're having for dinner that night or their jobs. Okay, they're, they're not really thinking like we are. We're a much more responsive crowd for courses on how to get more traffic. Okay, so any clicks I got from this room, I would rather have you guys clicking on my ads than that crowd. So can you see the difference there? These clicks would be worth a lot more, like a multiple or maybe 10 times or more than any clicks from the next room. The buying cycle, this is important to understand. Every time someone buys, they go through this process. So rarely do we just decide we want to buy. Usually, the more expensive the product, the longer this buying cycle is going to be. And it starts off usually with an awareness, then consideration, then interest, preference, and then purchase. 
but it's a series of stages we each go through. And you can see on the right side, anyone who's at the, the stage on the end, they're virtually, they virtually have a credit card in hand and they're ready to spend money. Okay, so they are ready to spend money. Whereas someone on the left side, they're just starting to get interested. So maybe they're not even at that stage yet where they're looking to spend money. Maybe they're just mildly curious. And it doesn't really mean whether they're going to buy or not. So an example of this is buying a car. When you decide to buy a car, you rarely wake up in the morning and say, I think I'm going to buy a car today. It doesn't happen like that, right? Usually what happens is you're driving in your existing car and you start to notice you know, it's getting a little bit old, the engine doesn't sound too good, the paint's fading, the air conditioner stops working. You start to notice all these little flaws and you start to entertain the idea of getting a brand new car. So you, you start to, to think about it more and more, you're becoming more and more responsive. So at first you might think about it twice a week. And then over time, you're thinking about it every single day. You're advancing along that buying cycle. Okay, so you're going through this process. Awareness, consideration, preference. Okay, so you start to think, all right, I'm going to go get a new car, or I'm going to start looking. You go to a car yard, you start to narrow it down to the make, to the model, to the year, and then at the end, you're ready to virtually buy. At the very end, you're, you know, you're going to, to Google and you're typing in something like uh, Ford Falcons 2003 second hand by now, something like that. Your search gets more and more specific. So that's usually the process that people go through. And what I want you to understand, this next thing, this is, this is something that I heard or I learned from Dagan Smith, a marketer uh, I really respect. I heard this last year and it's always stood out in my mind. If you're going to go and buy traffic, and as I said, all traffic has a cost, so any time you get traffic, you're essentially buying it, there's, you're either doing one of two different things. So you've got fixed cost advertising, or you've got performance-based advertising. Now, fixed cost is when you outlay an amount, okay, so you pay up front, and then any response you get after that, you know, you're not really paying for that response. You've already outlaid your money. So an example, Let's say you place a banner ad on a website, you're going to pay that website up front. Then they'll show you banner ad for, say, 30 days. That's an example of fixed cost. Or another example, you place an ad in a newspaper. So you pay the newspaper in advance. Or if you do an e-zine solo ad, you pay someone to send out a, an email to their list promoting your site, you usually pay in advance. Now, I want you to write this down. Your only goal with fixed cost advertising is to maximize response. That's your only goal. You want as many people clicking on your ads as possible. Okay? Now, performance based, slightly different. Performance based advertising, this is where you pay every time someone takes an action. So, for example, Facebook pay per click or any pay per click. Every time someone clicks on your ad and there's an action, you pay for that. You might pay you know, 20 cents a click, you might pay $1.50 a click, but every time someone takes an action, you're paying for it. Same with CPA, cost per action, a little bit more advanced, or pay-per-view, PPV. Those sort of things are pay, uh, they are performance-based advertising. Every time someone takes an action, you pay. Now, in this case, your objective is not to maximize response because if you're doing pay-per-click on, on Facebook, if that was your goal to maximize response, you, like I said, you could get 10,000 clicks or 10,000 people in front of your website by tomorrow if you were willing to pay for it. You'd have a very big bill. So if your goal is to maximize response, you would go broke very quickly. Instead, with performance-based advertising, your goal is to get the most targeted response. So you can see the buying cycle there, and at the very end, when people are virtually ready to buy, credit card in hand, these are the prospects that you're targeting. You're paying every time they take an action. So you don't want people clicking on your ads who aren't good leads, who aren't going to convert. Why would you want to pay a dollar to have someone click on your ad, put them in front of your website who have no interest in what you're offering? You'd go broke very quickly. 
So anytime you do performance-based advertising, that's your objective. Now, before we get into pay-per-click on Facebook, I want to just talk about pay-per-click on the search engines very quickly. It's important you understand. Uh, Facebook pay-per-click, the biggest mistake people make is thinking of it as if it's like pay-per-click on the search engines, like Google AdWords. And it's not. It's entirely different. You see, on the search engines, let's say, you know, if we go back in time about five years when home business entrepreneurs were still allowed on Google, um, what you might do is you would, you would be advertising based on keywords. So anytime someone types in a keyword that you're bidding on, your ad would actually show. So if they type in something like, start an online business, you might bid on that keyword so Google would show your ad based on that keyword. Why is, why is that so important? Well, one of the best direct response marketers who ever lived, Robert Collier, this is what he had to say, always enter, enter the conversation taking place in your customer's mind or your prospect's mind. So in everything you do when marketing, your ads, your lead capture page, your sales video, essentially what you're doing is you're echoing back their conversation to them. You use their language. You talk to them just how they're talking to their, themselves in their head. That's how you're going to get the highest response. Based on the keyword that they typed in, you could tell where they're up to in that buying process. You could tell whether they are just starting to get interested or whether they, they're at the the last stage where they're searching with credit card in hand and they're ready to buy. Based on that keyword, you could get a very good idea of what's going on in their mind. Okay, and that's priceless. Facebook, it's different. With Facebook, we're targeting people based on their likes. So when you're on Facebook and you click on like, you know, if you like someone's fan page, you're saying you like that and Facebook record that and then advertisers, like you and me, come along and we have our ads shown to people based on their likes. So if someone likes Jonathan Budd, right, he's got like 30,000 fans, if someone clicks on like Jonathan Budd, if we want, we can target his 30,000 fans by having our ads shown to all the people who clicked on like for Jonathan Budd. Now a like, think about that, when someone clicks on the like button, it's not a very big commitment. Okay, it's not a very big commitment. Maybe they were just get, clicking on like to get the lead magnet, whatever was being offered. So what that means is that all the clicks you buy on Facebook, generally speaking, they're going to be much less responsive than the clicks you could potentially get on, say, Google AdWords. Pay per click on Google. Now, if you gave me a choice between buying clicks on Google AdWords and buying clicks on Facebook pay-per-click and they were the same price, I would happily take the clicks on Google AdWords every day of the week. And the reason is, based on the keyword, I can get information about what they're thinking at that point in time. Now, Facebook, I can get a lot of uh, demographical information, age, sex, location. However, like Robert Collier said, you want to enter the conversation going on in their mind. So I would much rather know their thoughts than where they live and what their age is. So you might be wondering, well, what's, what's the big deal about Facebook pay-per-click if it's, if it's not good as pay-per-click on the search engine? And there's two things. Number one uh, is volume. There's a lot of traffic on Facebook. There's something like 680 million users by next year. It's estimated there will be 1 billion users. So there's a ton of traffic there. Uh, and people spend more time on Facebook than they spend on the next four largest sites combined. So people spend a lot of time on Facebook. The internet is virtually becoming Facebook. People go on the internet, usually they're going on for Facebook. It's everything. And the second big opportunity is it's still very cheap traffic. You see, the clicks that you buy on Facebook, they don't yet truly reflect the market value of those clicks. They don't, not yet, but they will. So the window of opportunity, it's constantly getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? What happens is whenever there's a new media source, what you've got to realize is that they all go through this process. I'll give you an example, okay? Whenever there's a new media source and you can buy advertising, 
traffic usually starts off very cheap because the people selling that space, like Facebook, they don't yet truly know what that space is worth, right? Because we haven't found that out through supply and demand yet. I'll give you an example. Infomercials. If you go back to the, the 70s or 80s, I think it was, infomercials were still very brand new. And there's two marketers called John Carlton and uh, Gary Halbert. Gary Halbert's no longer alive, but two very good marketers. What they would do is, back in those days, is they would shoot an infomercial, they'd film it, you know, like at home or in their little studio, and they would go and put that on the TV networks that night because the TV networks didn't realise the value of that time. The TV networks thought, well, you know, no one's watching TV from midnight to 5 a.m., so we'll virtually give that space away. And that's what they were willing to do. They were willing to give it away for very cheap. So marketers like John Carlton, Gary Halbert, they could easily afford to rent that space and show their infomercial. They put up an infomercial. If it didn't make sales, they'd simply go and reshoot it the next day and then they'd put it on that night and see if they made any money. Now, if you fast forward to today, now it's a very different story. If you want to get into the infomercial marketing business, you've got to have millions of dollars usually just to get your foot in the door. You've got to have a very high converting offer. And now it's an industry dominated by multi-billion dollar companies like Guthy Renka. Okay, you can't just go and get into that industry. And the reason is the TV network soon figured out that in fact there were people watching from the hours of midnight to 5 a.m. and they were buying. So that space had much more value than they were charging. And they put up their prices and that drove all the small time entrepreneurs out and the companies that knew what they were doing got bigger and bigger and bigger, just like the farming industry. Okay? Google, back in its early days, on pay-per-click, was essentially the same. Anyone could get involved. Clicks were very cheap. But what happened over time? They got more and more expensive because Google realised that those clicks that they were selling for 20 cents were actually worth more like a dollar. And the best marketers or the best online businesses, they had a higher average Vista value than the others. They were willing to pay more. They're willing to pay 50 cents if their average Vista value is a dollar because they're still making a 50 cent profit. This is what happens. This is the US cost per click over the past, well, this is from 2003 to 2009. And what do you notice? It's getting more and more expensive. Why? Because the online businesses that are better at extracting that value, that have a higher average Vista value, they're willing to pay more for those clicks. Prices go up. The small time players get pushed out. Okay, and that's what happens. Same with infomercial, same, same with everything. Now right now, Facebook pay per click, it's still quite cheap. So if you're not doing it yet, there's still a big opportunity to start doing it. However, what's going to happen is 10, 20 years from now, you know, you're, you're going to be sitting there with you, your grandchild sitting on your lap and they will ask you, you know, Pop, were you there back in Facebook pay-per-click days or, or whatever? And you're either going to say, yes, son, I was, and I made a fortune. I made millions. Or you're going to say, no, I wasn't. And you're going to look back with regret. So I will guarantee you that 5, 10, 20 years from now, you know, you're either going to look back with regret or you're going to look back and say, I got in at the right time. Happened with Google AdWords, it happens with virtually every new media. Starts off being quite cheap, prices soon go up. Okay, so if you're not on Facebook right now, you really, this is the time to get in. All right, as I say here, prices of clicks, they will rise to match the value that can be derived from those clicks. So if Facebook is selling clicks right now for 50 cents, and I have a, an average Vista value of 75 cents, well, I'm willing to pay up to 75 cents for those clicks. Whereas if you only have a, an average Vista value of 20 cents, you might go on Facebook for a week, lose money and say, okay, it doesn't work. But I'll keep on doing it and I will push up the prices. So can you see how that works? Now, all right, let's get started on Facebook pay-per-click and just very briefly, 
If you've never done pay-per-click before, I just want to, want to bring you up to speed and just tell you the, the basic terms. First, you've got CPC, which is cost per click. Every time someone clicks on your ad, your credit card is going to be charged. Right? That's what cost per click is. So if you get 100 clicks in a day and those clicks are a dollar, right? well then, that's $100 a day you've spent on advertising. Your bid, this is how much you're willing, willing to pay for a click. So when you place your first advertisement on Facebook, pay-per-click, you're going to tell them, I'm willing to spend this amount on a click. Your bid really matches what you actually pay. It's kind of like an auction. If you buy a house, you might be willing to pay, I don't know, $250,000 for it, but based on the other people in the room, maybe you only have to pay $200,000. So your bid does not necessarily mean how much you're going to have to pay. Impressions. An impression is every time your ad is shown. Okay, note the key word there, shown, does not necessarily mean seen. So your ad might be shown 10,000 times in a day, but maybe, maybe only 500 people actually see it or notice it and less even click on it. That's impressions. Now, if you take clicks and you divide them by impressions, let's say you get, let's say you get 100 clicks in a day and you get 10,000 impressions. You would take 100 clicks, divide it by 10,000 impressions, and that would equal a click-through rate of 1%. And what that tells us that is that on average, for every 100 times that our ad was shown, at least one person clicked on it. That's your click-through rate. CPM is simply cost per 1,000 impressions. M is the Roman numeral for 1,000. So you can either choose to pay cost per click, which is, you know, you pay every time someone clicks on an ad, or you can pay cost per 1,000 impressions. When you get started, usually I recommend cost per click. Now, very quickly, I just want to show you, if you've never placed an ad before, here's how to do it in three easy steps. Log into your Facebook account. Uh, in the left, on the menu, you, you're going to see ads. Simply click on that. Top right, you will see create an ad. Click on that. And then this is where you're going to put in your ad. And you will notice it's got URL. That's a fancy name for website. Title. So you've got, you've got like 25 characters, I think, or it might be 35. 25 characters for your title. That's like the little headline of your ad. You've got 135 for your body and that's like three or four lines in the actual body. And then you've got the image. So Facebook, it's not just words, it's actually an image too. So you simply get the image, save it on your desktop, and upload it. And that's, that's as easy as it is. Next we have targeting. Okay, this is, this is you choosing who you want to display your ads to. So you've got country. Usually if I'm marketing an offer, uh, usually I just do US, Canada, Australia, uh, in the UK. Okay, you can experiment with that, but if you're, you, know, you want to market your offer to people who speak the same language of your offer. So obviously, you know, you don't want to go marketing to someone who can't even read your website. All right, so you want to put some thought into that. You've got age, uh, gender. The part I want to show you is interests. This is the most important part. This is where you're going to specify who you show your ads to based on their likes. So let's say that I'm brand new to Facebook and I see Jonathan Budd's fan page and I click on like and then you come along and you choose Jonathan Budd. You put Jonathan Budd in the interest. What that means is because I'm a fan and I'm interested in Jonathan Budd because I've clicked the like button, your ads could be potentially showed to me. So interest is kind of like keywords on Google AdWords, pay-per-click on, on Google. That's the closest you get. So interest gives you an insight into what they're thinking in their minds. As I said, that's far more important than any demographics like age, sex, location. Okay, you, it's much better to know what they're thinking in their minds. Interest, that gives you the best clue. Then we've got uh, workplaces. Just briefly want to talk about this. If, if you're in the home business industry, uh, what you can do to get more targeted clicks is you can... For workplaces, let's say you're, you want, you're selling a course uh, like the seven-figure networker, right? you're promoting something to people in the, in the home business industry, you can go to workplaces and you can actually type in a network marketing company like Amway, Jubilee, ACN, whatever. Because when people go to Facebook, 
they can choose to list their employer. Now, let me ask you, what do you think would be a better lead? Would it be someone who's said they, they work for Amway or someone who says they like Amway? It's going to be someone who says they work for Amway because someone might be using you know, Amway uh, face cream or toothpaste or whatever they sell and they might like that product, so they might click on like for Amway. That does not necessarily mean that they're interested in our industry. However, if someone say they, they work for Amway, that tells you that there's a very good chance they're a distributor, they're actually in this industry. Okay, so that's going to be a much more responsive lead than someone who just clicks on like. It's a much bigger commitment to say you work for a company than to just say you like it. Okay, so that's how you can get more targeted clicks. Uh, pricing, this is where you're going to bid for your cost per click. Uh, Facebook, they're going to give you a suggested bid. So they might say 75 cents to $1.50. Usually what I do is I will bid 10% higher than the lower bid rate. So if they say 70 cents, I'll bid something like 77 cents. Like I said, uh, your bid does not necessarily match what you pay. So if your bid is like $2, it doesn't mean you're going to pay $2 per click. It just means you know, that's your bid and you're telling Facebook what you're willing to pay for that space. So that's how you do it. Now, writing ads. People often, you know, most, most of you will know the importance of split testing, having two ads run at the same time. And you might be wondering, well, how do I split test? Like, do I, do I write two ads and just have slightly different words or do I write two completely different ads? How, how do I test? I want to show you how to do it. There's four levels at which you can write your ads. Okay, so it starts off level four. This is the main idea of your ad. Level three, you're going to change up the order. So you put like sentences in different orders in that little body copy of your ad. Uh, level two, choose different words. Level one, that's where you really fine tune that ad. You change punctuation. Okay? Now, as I said, body copy, it's 135 characters. Headline, it's like 25 characters. Your image, you get, you want to write this down, you get 120 pixels by 80 pixels. Those are the dimensions of your image. You want to take up all the space that they give you for your image. I'll explain why in just a moment. To do that, go to a site called pickresize.com. Upload your image and then you can simply resize it to fit those exact dimensions. So when you place your Facebook pay-per-click ad, your image fits nice, nicely in that little space. Now here's what I do when I'm writing out ads and here's what I want you to do. Start off by writing 30 different ads for your offer, 30. Because the first ads that you write usually aren't that good, right? Because you're just getting warmed up. But as you write 10, 20, so on, they get better and better. You start to get a little bit more creative, approach it from different angles, and they, they get to be better ads. Choose your top three, and for each of those three ads, you have three different images. Okay, three different images. I want to show you, this is level four. So level four is where you have, you're testing the main offer or the main message. Okay, so I hope you can see that. Um, basically, I've got two ads here. They aren't the best ads. I wrote these ads, and to be honest, I, I ripped off uh, Frank Kern. So you might have noticed that they're, they're exactly the same as Frank Kern's. But anyway, I just want to show you this as an example. So two different ads. These are going to the site webinarconferencecalls.com. And this is, this is something really exciting we've been working on okay, for the past few months. So if you haven't seen that site, webinarconferencecalls.com, we believe this is the future of this industry. But anyway, I've got two ads. And you can see they're very different ads. They've got different images, one of Jonathan looking serious, one of Jonathan flying in his car. They've got red borders, uh, different headlines. Jonathan is live tonight. The other is marketing step by step. These are sending people to a website with a perpetual webinar. It's like a live event that plays every single night. It's actually a recording, but it feels like a live event. Event-driven marketing. Okay, so this, this is what we're doing. Now, on the left, you can see it says, highest paid 20-something-year-old internet marketing consultant consultant is hosting a free webinar for internet marketers register for free on the right it says tonight 
I'll be sharing with you step by step how to get a ton of leads. This free live training is going to rock register now. You can see there are two very different messages. This is level four, and this is where you start off. Now level three, this is where you're going to change around the orders of the words. So on the left, you can see we've still got that same ad, Jonathan is live tonight, and on the right, all we've done is we've switched the order. So instead of starting off by stating the benefit, we have the call to action at the front. So we have register for tonight's free webinar. Instead of having that at the end, we've switched that to the top. We've just changed the order of the sentences. Now usually what you want to do is you want to have a benefit first, you know, what they're going to get and how that's going to help them, and then you have the call to action. So this ad on the right usually wouldn't beat the ad on the left, but we're just testing the different order. That's level three, so you're simply changing the order of sentences around. Now level two, this is where you're going to start really fine tuning it. So you can see here, all I've done, I've still got that ad on the left, exactly the same, but the ad on the right still says Jonathan is live tonight, but on the right it says, instead of highest paid, it says top earning. I'm using different words. Instead of internet marketing consultant, I've got network marketing strategist. Okay? Instead of is hosting a free webinar, I've got is teaching a free online workshop. Instead of register for free, I've got register now, it's free. So it's exactly the same message, but we've just changed uh, different words. And this can make a huge difference. Just changing words in your ad can make a huge difference to what you pay. Okay, so we're starting to fine tune this ad a little bit more. Level one, it's exactly the same ad. All we've done is we've got live in all capitals. So now this is where all we're doing is changing punctuation. Really, that's all we're doing. We're adding in commas, exclamation marks, capital letters, etc. So we've got here every single word has a capital letter at the start. That's all we're doing. These two ads, they're exactly the same. Some have capitals and some don't, but you would, you would be surprised at how different a response they get. But now we're really refining this ad. Now, if you're putting an ad up for the first time, you don't ever start off at this level. So you don't ever write two ads and have them exactly the same and just make very small fine-tuning adjustments like I've done here. Instead, start off at level four. Have them be a completely different message, see what works, and then fine-tune. Okay, now getting cheap clicks by maximizing click-through rate. Facebook, they want you to have a high click-through rate. So again, click-through rate is clicks divided by impressions. It's basically how many people click on your ads. The reason why they want to maximize it is because they're, they're essentially renting you space on Facebook and they want to make the most money they can for that space. So if you have a terrible ad and no one clicks on it, they're not making much money. So they are going to punish you if you have a poor ad by charging you a higher cost per click. But if you have a good ad that a lot of people click on and you have a high click-through rate, they will reward you by giving you cheaper uh, cost per clicks. Now, just so you know, if you have a click-through rate of above 1%, you're doing very, very well. Okay? And that will usually give you fairly cheap clicks. So what that means is, on average, more than one people for every 100 times your ad is shown are clicking on your ad. Click-through rate of above 0.5% to 1%, that's okay, that's acceptable. A click-through rate of less than 0.1%, that's shocking. Okay, so you're, go you're gonna get high uh, cost per clicks for that. Okay, so you've gotta make your ad so it stands out. Now you can see an image there, that's a screenshot of Facebook and that's actually what you call a heat map. And what these crazy scientists do is they, they, uh, they attach these devices to these people who look at Facebook and they, uh, they do it a few hundred times. And this tells us where their eyes usually are looking on Facebook. You can see in the top left sort of corner in the status updates area, that's where most people are looking when they're on Facebook. On the right side, you can see hardly anyone's looking there. That's where your ad is. So your ad... They're not looking at that part of the screen. You have to get their attention. The way you do that, one of the easiest ways is to change your image. 
Now, some experts say that the image accounts for up to 40% of the response for your ad. So just having a different image can make a huge difference. Some tips, uh, what you can do is you can use a, a bright red or yellow or, or pink or whatever fluorescent border around your image. Okay, so you put a very bright border around it and it stands out a lot more. Uh, don't be boring. Okay, that's the, the biggest sin in marketing is to be boring. So don't make your ad boring. Don't have an image that blends in with the background because no one's going to, to click on it. You're going to have a low click-through rate and therefore Facebook, they're going to really penalise you by charging you a very high cost per click. Okay? Use images that are relevant to the fan page. So, for example, if I'm marketing to MLM companies, usually what I do, it's, it's a little bit cheeky, and I'm, I'm not sure what the legal uh, things are, but I will usually use the logo of that company in my ad. Now, if you're in, let's say you're in ACN, and you see the company ACN, the logo, in your ad, that has meaning to you. Okay, that has meaning to you, so you're more likely to click on it. So you get a higher click-through rate, a cheaper cost per click. And then you want to adjust your, your copy, so the words in your ad. So a big tip is to make your ad specific to the page you're targeting. Now, if I'm targeting, again, the company ACN, I can have ACN in the words on my ad. So in the headline of that ad, I might have something like, are you in ACN? Just a simple question. If I'm in ACN, that has personal meaning to me. Okay, so I'm much more likely to click on it. So always get as specific as you can. Don't have generic ads. So don't, don't ever say something like, are you in MLM? Question mark. Instead say, are you in ACN? Question mark. It's a lot more specific. You're going to have a much higher click-through rate and your clicks will be much, much cheaper. Now, customize your each landing page. So when they click on your ad, they go to your opt-in page or your landing page, customise each one so it has personal meaning to them. So if you're marketing to ACN, have the name ACN on your landing page. If they click on your ad and they go to a landing page that's generic and it's talking about MLM, you're going to have a much lower opt-in rate than a landing page that is specific, that's talking about ACN. So if that means that you have to go and create 20 different opt-in page, pages for each company you're targeting, then do it because you're going to get a much higher opt-in rate and your cost per lead will be much lower. Okay, because essentially, we're not, this isn't a, really about clicks, it's about getting leads. That's what we're concerned about. So just getting someone to our site is not enough. We want them to actually opt in to give us their contact de details so we can follow up. Now you can see a graph here. This is quite interesting. This is the click-through rate of an add-on ours, of ours. You can see the click-through rate on the y-axis uh, ranges from 0% up to 0.1%. And on the x-axis, you can see this is from uh, July the 10th to July the 24th. It's over like three weeks. And you can see the click-through rate starts off at about 0.06%. So what that means is six people, for every 1,000 impressions, six people clicked on it. That's your click-through rate. That's where it started off. But over three weeks, what do you notice? It's going down and down and down. It's trending downwards. That ad is becoming less and less responsive because people are seeing your ad, they're getting used to it, and it's blending into the background. It's getting boring. So you're getting less clicks. So what you want to do is you want to change up your ads often. Usually I recommend about a week. Change your ads every week. Keep them fresh. Okay, you've got to keep those click-through rates up nice and high. Split testing ads. I want to show you two ads. Now, I will admit these are pretty shocking ads. Uh, I wrote them a few months ago, but they're, they're not the best ads. But the reason why I want to show you this is to show you the importance of testing. These are two ads getting people to click like on Jonathan's fan page. So they click on the ad, they go to Jonathan's fan page. They are exactly the same. The only difference is the image. Completely uh, different images, but the rest of the ads are completely the same. The top one, you can see we've spent over $2,000 on clicks, got our 2,524 clicks 
people who have clicked on that ad. You can't really see it, but the CTR or click-through rate of the top ad is 0.051%. So I guess what that means is like five in, for every 10,000 impressions, five people click on it. Okay, so it's not that high. The average cost per click for that top ad is 83 cents. Every time someone clicks like, our credit card is charged 83 cents. Bottom ad, exactly the same, just a slightly different image. Instead of Jonathan in his rear vision mirror, it's Jonathan sitting on the, the bonnet of his car. This one, the click-through rate, instead of 0.51%, it's 0.92%, almost double. Cost per click, the bottom ad is, instead of 83 cents, it's 61 cents. That's a very big difference. That means that the bottom ad was like almost 25% cheaper than the top ad. And that can be the difference between whether you make money on Facebook or you lose money. So I just wanted to point that out. It's a very small difference, just using a different image, but it makes a huge difference in your response. Now, split testing. Okay, so if you wondered, well, how do I keep all of this organized and neat and tidy? This is how I do it. Okay, now you can't really see that, but I'm using Google Docs. And if we zoom in, this is what we see. We see I've got the week. So you can see here it's the 16th of July to the 23rd, seven days. I've got the ad. So the ad says, headline, more traffic, more leads. The body says, bizarre video reveals single greater source of leads and how to scoop them up for pennies into your email to watch for free. So that's the copy of the ad. And then you can see below that, I've got image one, image two, image three. So for every ad, I'll show it for a week, and I want to use three different images for that ad. So I'll have that ad with image one, then I'll create another campaign, same ad with a different image, image two, and then again, image three. So I have three versions of the same week. And this one, we're targeting gurus. So you can see all the MLM gurus there. And then the numbers that you're seeing are the average cost per click for those different ads. So ad one, image one, we're targeting, we're going after Ann Sieg's followers. You see it's 53 cents there. These numbers are completely made up, okay? But I'm just showing you this as an example. If we're targeting Dagan Smith, ad one, image one is 24 cents. This is after a week. So I'm having my virtual assistant log into my Facebook account and find the average cost per click. Ad one, image three, has a different cost per click. Same ad, different image. At the end, we're going to record what was the winner, which ad got the cheapest clicks. And I don't know if you can see that, but you can, you can see most of them have ad one, image three. That tells us that the ad with the, the third image is giving us the cheapest cost per click. That's how we find the winner. So again, you want to have this in, in your little spreadsheet. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do it. You can find an assistant in the Philippines, just like I have, $2 an hour. You can have them on a part-time basis. So, you know, $4 a day, it's not exactly much, but they can go into your Facebook account and put in your numbers for you. Now, organizing campaigns and ad groups. So if you're just getting started, um, you, can, you can literally end up having hundreds of ads. And if you've ever wondered, well, how do I keep this all organized and not confuse myself? I want to show you how I do it. So first off, when I say campaigns, I'm talking about groups of related fan pages. So let's say we're promoting Jonathan's The Seven Figure Networker. One of our groups that we can target are MLM gurus. So all the fans of MLM gurus are likely to be good prospects for our course. Another campaign could be MLM companies. Okay, we can actually go after the distributors. Or it could be MLM systems, like My Lead System Pro. We can target all of their fans. All right, so that's how you, that's what campaigns are. And then you're going to have all of your ads in the campaigns. So if, we're if we have a campaign for MLM gurus, if you click on that campaign, you might see a hundred different gurus and we're targeting all of their fans. Okay, so usually that's how I do it. Now, I just want to point out, 
submitting ads is not something that you want to be doing. Like if you've never done it before, well then sure, do it for two or three days, learn how it works. But you want to outsource that fairly quickly because that's very low leverage manual labor. You don't want to be doing that yourself. Instead, you want to outsource that. Just like I said, find an assistant. I highly recommend the Philippines. Um, you, right now I have two assistants, $2 an hour, and that's all they do all day. They submit my ads. Now, what I do is I write the ads, I choose the images, and I target the fan pages. That's the high leverage activity. But manually typing in the ads, that's a low leverage activity. And the reason is, a lot of your ads will get dis disapproved. Okay, that's just the fact of life on Facebook. A lot of your ads get disapproved because Facebook have very uh, arbitrary uh, rules for what they let through and what they don't. So usually, I'll submit an ad three times, and if it gets rejected three times in a row, then I will change it. Okay, and Facebook, they're actually, uh, got to be a little bit careful, they're actually cracking down on accounts right now. I had mine uh, deleted or, or blocked uh, literally about three days ago. So if you're, uh, it's not a big deal, I've just got to create another account and start doing it again. But if you're submitting ads and they're constantly getting disapproved, be a little bit careful, okay? Because right now, like I said, they are cracking down on accounts and they can actually disable your account. It's not a big deal, just go and create another one and just start again, okay? And you just change your approach. Now, uh, so this is how I do it. MLM companies, like if I'm marketing, let's say we're marketing the Seven Figure Networker, you can he see here I've got three fan pages for three different companies. We've got Herbalife, uh, Jubilee, ACN. There's a lot more, okay? There's potentially hundreds of different MLM companies you could target. So all of these fan pages, we would have one ad per company. So when we write an ad and we get down to the likes and interest, you only ever put one fan page. So don't put ACN, Amway, Jubilee, etc., all in the same ad. That's untargeted. Write one ad per company and put the company name in your ad, if you can, make it more specific. You'll get a higher click-through rate, cheaper clicks. MLM gurus, so if you wanted to, you could target, you know, Jonathan Bard's followers, Mike Dillard, Ann Sieg, Danny Johnson, lots of them. Uh, MLM systems, Okay, so you could target all the fans of uh, magnetic sponsoring, My Lead System Pro, etc. But this, I'm just showing you this so you know the structure of campaigns. Now, this next part, this is really important. This is, if you understand this, this will make your job a lot easier on Facebook. This is what, what is called turn the corner marketing. See, what you have to realize is that if you're marketing to people based on the likes they've clicked, Clicking on like doesn't tell us where they're up to in the buying cycle. For example, if, I, if someone clicks on like Jonathan Budd, maybe they're just getting interested in this industry, but they're, you know, they're standing on the sidelines, they're not really looking to spend money yet. But then again, maybe they've got a credit card in hand and they are actively looking for products uh, to teach them, you know, something like Facebook pay-per-click marketing. So they see Jonathan's course, Get Traffic 3.9, and they're ready to buy. So anywhere, uh, any, any, anyone who clicks on like, you don't know where they're up to in the buying process. The truth is they could be anywhere at any of these different stages. That's part of the reason why Facebook pay-per-click traffic is a lot less responsive than the traffic you could get on the search engines when you could still do pay-per-click there. So what this means is that a lot of people who click on your ads, you're essentially interrupting them and they're not actively looking for your solution. What that, what that means to you as a marketer is what you have to do is you've got to point out that problem. And then the second step is you've got to agitate that problem. This might sound like manipulation, but look, if you have a great product, it's your responsibility to do everything you can as a marketer to get it into their hands. Right, so we have a problem, we agitate, there's a solution. So you can see that, those circles there, that represents targeted traffic right in the center, and then you've got less and less and less targeted traffic. Someone clicking on a like, as you can see, they could be anywhere within those rings. So your marketing must be able to point out the problem 
agitate that problem and then offer the solution. An example, I've got a course called How to Build a Funded Proposal for Network Marketers. It shows network marketers how to create their own sales funnel and then how to actually get leads, sell a front end product and then use those new customers uh, as your prospects for your network marketing company. Now, it's called How to Build a Funded Proposal. If I go and market that to people who are fans of, say, ACN or Amway, the truth is 99% of them have no idea what a funded proposal is, so that has no meaning to them. And they have no motivation to get a funded pro proposal. So instead, what I do is I point out the problem first. I tell them that, look, if you're going to continue in this industry doing the old doing it the old-fashioned way, approaching friends and family, that sort of thing, here's what you've got to look forward to. And I tell them my story. I tell them how in 2008, uh, age 22, I got into this industry. I invested in a top-tier company, $38,000 of my life savings, pretty much everything I'd ever saved up. And then I tell them how I went full-time. And for the next nine months, uh, I did not get one sale were working full time. So I had nothing coming in. I was constantly pouring money out. I tell them how bad that was. You know, I tell them how, you know, I went through depression for a while and just, you know, having friends and family, you know, I think it's a big joke. All of my money was in this company. I tell them really how bad that was. And then I tell them, this is what you potentially have to look forward to. Okay, if you're not do it, if you're not using a funded proposal to get targeted prospects in front of your business, you're likely going to be like most people in this industry who approach friends and family and just never really get anywhere. So I'm pointing out the problem, but I'm also pointing out the consequences of that problem. I'm agitating that problem. And by doing so, I'm creating the need, I'm creating the need for them to want to find a solution. Then I present my solution, which is my course. Now, can you see, if someone clicks on my ad on Facebook and they don't yet know that they need a funded proposal, and I just point out the problem and then the solution, that's not really enough to convert them into a sale. However, if I really agitate that problem, okay, be, you know, I'm not saying you be dishonest, but I'm saying be completely honest about it, talk about the consequences. By doing so, now you're helping to create the need because they might not realise they yet have that need. But in your sales video or your sales letter, if you point out that, yes, you know, you have a problem and these are the consequences, if you don't act, then you're helping to create that need. So when you present your product, now they're much more likely to buy. So if you're going to do Facebook pay-per-click, this, this one slide is really important. You've got to help, them cre you've got to help create that need. Now, you want to think of your Facebook pay-per-click ads as employees. This is also important. You see, you can end up with having hundreds of different little pay-per-click ads. Think of them as, pretend you, you own a, a telemarketing business and every single day you have 100 employees who come into your office, you know, you're renting that space and so you're the business owner and they make cold calls. Let's pretend that's, that's you, right? And you've got these 100 people that come in and you've got a group of these employees who arrive to late work, they're lazy, just like this guy in the photo, they don't make cold calls, they're not making you sales. And at the end of the week, you have to pay them a salary, regardless of whether they got results or not. Your pay-per-click ads are exactly the same. You're paying every time someone clicks on an ad, but if they're not bringing in sales, you still pay. It's different to, to if you had your own affiliates. If you have your own affiliates, that's people sending you traffic, you only pay them a commission when a sale is made. So if you have your own affiliates, that, that's like having your own sales force and they're paid on commission only. With pay-per-click ads, they're paid on salary. You're paying every time someone clicks regardless of whether a sale is made. Now, if that's you, would you keep on paying someone you know, after 10 weeks if they hadn't yet made you one sale? You wouldn't. You would say to them, I'm sorry, but this isn't for you. You'd have to let them go. And you'd have to replace them with someone else who's more serious about the job. This is exactly what it's like with your pay-per-click ads. You need to find the ones that are making you money and you need to stop the ones that aren't bringing in sales because they, they can literally 
uh, send you broke or end up costing you a lot of money. So we have a little saying here, starve the ponies and feed the stallions. That's your sort of philosophy to managing ads. Starve the ponies and feed the stallions. Find the ones that are getting you results, invest more money in those ads, and cut off the ones that are just costing you money and aren't getting you sales. You've all heard of the 80-20 principle. Well, this is, this is the 80-20 principle because a very small percentage of your ads will account for most of your results. There is a belief in the business world, one of the most dangerous beliefs, uh, and it would cost our economy billions and billions of dollars every single year, and that's the 50-50 fallacy. It's the idea that your, your outputs are the average of all of your inputs. So if you spend, if you have 500 different pay-per-click ads and you make $1,000 in sales, it's the idea that each of those ads brought in $2 in sales. And that's a very dangerous belief to have because the reality is that maybe 400 of those ads cost you money and the other 100 made you money. So don't ever do that. Don't ever think that your, your total sales is just the average of your individual ads. Usually there's a small percentage of your ads that account for the majority of your results. And your job as marketing manager in your business is to find those ads that are getting your results, invest more money in those, and cut off the losers. Okay, and this, this is the case with everything. I mean, if you're an MLM, you might have noticed that if you built up a team, you can get one person on your team who brings in more sales than the other 20 on, people on your team combined. Okay, I noticed that the first time when, when I started building a team. I found one lady and she brought in more sales than the 10 others combined. Okay, it's the 80-20 the principle. Same with affiliates. So for Get Traffic 3.0, Jonathan's launched last year, he's got over 10,000 affiliates, people who can potentially promote Get Traffic 3.0. You don't guarantee you that that launch that did $1.5 million in sales, most of these sales that came from affiliates, you could account maybe 70 to 80%, possibly more, from just 50 affiliates out of 10,000. That's the way it is in the world. That's how things work. It's the same with your ads. You've got to find that small percentage that's giving you the most results. Now, you might be wondering, well, how do I do that? How do I track right down to ad? I'm going to show you how. Okay, and this next thing I'm going to show you, this is really, really important. Don't ever judge your ads and traffic source based only on cost per click. You need to be able to track right through from the ad all the way through to the sale. So if you're getting sales, you want to know which specific ads they're clicking on that are converting into sales because you want to put money in, more money into those, find the winners. So, like I said, start the ponies and feed the stallions. The number that you want to know is cost per sale. So, in other words, how much do I need to spend on average to make a sale? So, if I'm selling a $5,000 product, how much do I need to spend on average from that traffic source to get a customer that's worth $5,000. Most people have no idea. Okay, but once you start measuring, you will. I want to show you why. This, pay extra attention to this. This is what most people in our industry do, judging their business on the surface level. So this, this is an example from one of Perry Marshall's clients. So Perry Marshall, he's a Mark Dye fellow. I saw this in a newsletter and I wanted to share this with you. This is a client he's got, and you can see this client has five different sources of customers or leads. They've got affiliates, they've got customer referrals, organic search, pay-per-click, and purchase leads. The cost, you can see for affiliates, $8,676 that month they spent to get traffic from affiliates. Purchase leads, $97,850. Number of leads from that particular traffic source. So we can see uh, purchase leads, they got just over 4,000 leads from that source. Uh, from customer referrals, on, only 214. CPL is cost per lead. On average, the leads from affiliates 
cost only $2.70, not a lot of money. Whereas the leads from pay-per-click cost over $40. Now, if I ask you, where would you invest most of your money if this was your business? Most people in our industry, they're going to say affiliates because average cost per lead is only $2.70. So why wouldn't you spend more money to get those cheap leads? Why would you spend $40 on pay-per-click for leads when you can get leads for just $2.70? So most people look at their business on the surface level. They look at, for example, cost per click, and they think, all right, well, I'm getting the cheapest cost per click here, therefore I invest more money in that particular source. That's looking at your business on the surface level. Most people do that, and it's very, very dangerous. And here's why. Let's take this a little bit deeper. Let's follow those leads all the way through to sale. So now we can see from those five different sources how many customers we got from those different sources. Affiliates, we got 12 customers. Organic search, we got 109. Cost per sale, so how much did we have to spend on average to get a customer? Let's say we're selling a $5,000 product. For affiliates, we had to spend $723 to make a $5,000 sale. For organic search, we only had to spend $133.94 to make that same $5,000 sale. Purchase leads, we had to spend almost $4,500 to make that same sale. So you can see, instead of, instead of saying that affiliates is the winner and we should invest more money in affiliates, the truth is, when you look below the surface, it's not affiliates, it's organic search. Okay, organic search is giving you the cheapest cost per sale. That's what we're concerned about, making sales, not getting leads. So this is looking at your business below the surface levels. Hardly anyone does this, but if you can start doing this, which I'm going to show you how very shortly, you, can, you know what's going on below the surface. You'll have a much greater chance of doing well. A quote by Perry Marshall. This is why it's important. The response to a single click gives you only a small part of the story what people do on an impulse, and what they choose to do over a long period of time are often very different. So if you have an image and it's getting a, you a, a really high click-through rate and really cheap clicks, uh, you know, you might... Sometimes you, you see uh, gurus who are teaching how to get more traffic, like there's a guy about my age who sells uh, Facebook pay-per-click training, and often in his status updates, he'll show a screenshot of how he's able to get clicks for 11 cents, as if that's a big achievement. And most people say, oh wow, you're, you know, you're so great, you can get clicks for 11 cents. The truth is, looking at your business on that level, it's a very sort of uh, immature, naive way to look at your business, because just because you can get an 11 cent click doesn't mean that that click converts into a sale, which is what we're concerned about here. So what I'm concerned about is cost per sale, not cost per click. Cost per click is important, but I want to know, did that ad actually convert into a sale? That's what I care about. So how do you do it? Well, this is how. If you've never done it before, simply go to Google and type in Google URL Builder. And I should just say, if you're going to do this, it's a given that you need Google Analytics on your site. So if you don't have Google Analytics, it's completely free, but that's how I measure all of my numbers on my sites. If you don't yet have that, have someone install that for you. You know, you shouldn't have to pay more than 20 bucks to have it done. Just go to a site like elance.com and learn, learn the basics of Google Analytics, how to actually log in and see the numbers. Okay, so once you've got Google Analytics, go to Google, type in Google URL Builder, click on the first one, and this is what you're gonna, you're gonna see. This is their little tool. Let's zoom in, and this is what you'll see. Three easy steps. Step one, you put in your domain of your website. So here we've got mysite.com. Could be your blog, could be anything. Okay, your lead capture page, whatever. Step two, this is where we're going to specify five different things. We've got campaign source. So, this link, this is what we're using in, in our ads, is this traffic coming from Google, Facebook, a forum, 
Where's it coming from? This is where you specify it. So here I've got Facebook. If I'm creating a Facebook pay-per-click ad, this is what I'm putting in. Facebook, campaign medium. Was that email marketing? Were you sending an email to your list? Was it pay-per-click? What was it? Okay, so here, pay-per-click. Campaign term. This is where you usually put in your keyword. So if you were doing pay-per-click on Google AdWords, you would put in your keyword here. For Facebook, this is where I like to put in the interest. So here I've got Mike D, Mike Dillard. Usually what I do is I won't put in their last name because they can see it in the link and you know, that could potentially annoy them. So I put Mike D just so they don't really know. Okay, but this is the fan page that I'm targeting. Campaign content, this is where I put the specific ad. So I've got here ad one, image three. I showed you that spreadsheet before. You have your ad. So add one, that's got your, your copy, your headline and your body text. And then you've got the image, three images per ad. So this is add one, image three. Could be, you know, it could be add three, image one, whatever. But this is telling us this specific ad. Campaign name, this campaign we're targeting MLM gurus, like Mike Dillard. Okay, so you put in those five things and you click on generate URL. And you can see at the bottom, it gives you this big, long link. And it looks like this. This one at the top, you can see it says mysite.com and it's added on all of this complex looking tracking code. Now, if you look at that and you don't really know what that means, that's perfectly fine. You don't really need to, but if you're looking closely, you can see it's still the same website, but it's got a source equals Facebook, medium, PPC, so on, term. It's got all of those things we entered have been added onto that link. Now, if you click on that link with all of that complex looking code, you still go to the exact same website. So they would still go to your blog or your lead capture page. The only difference is that code on the end, Google Analytics will record that. So when you log into your Google Analytics account, you can see exactly where your traffic is coming from. Uh, you can see on the, on the left, go to my stats. And if you click on, I think it's my best links, most of the, the good affiliate programs have this ability. It's got something called sub ID tracking. And what that means is you can take your little affiliate links and you can add in where you want to send traffic from, just like we did with Google URL Builder. All right, so you could say, you know, we're, we're targeting uh, Facebook pay per click leads, we're targeting Mike Dillard's fans, and click on generate link, and his affiliate program would give you a link. So now whenever you do ads on Facebook, sending traffic to your affiliate link, now those sales are actually being tracked. So we can see here, this, this is not a very good example because this was a few months ago when uh, there was actually a small error in the affiliate tracking that we had to have had fixed. But you can see SID stands for sub-ID. In the top, we've got MLM gurus underscore Jonathan B underscore add one image three. This tells us that this particular link that we were using was for the ad targeting Jonathan Bard's followers and it was for the ad add one image three. We can see the conversion rate. Again, there's, there's errors in this, so don't pay too much attention to that. But we can also see sales, sales that came from that particular link. Okay, so we would be able to see every single one of our little Facebook pay-per-click ads would have their own unique link for that ad. So we can actually track which ads bring in sales and which don't. And this is just maybe 10 of them, but we could potentially have hundreds of them. We could find our, our top five ads that are virtually allowing us to print money, and we could find the 95 ads that are costing us money but aren't bringing in any sales. But if you're not doing this, you have no idea. So you, you're virtually spending money and you're hoping you get some sales. And that's dangerous. So if you use this, this actually allows you to really know what's going on below the surface of your business. So guys, to, to wrap things up, I want you to understand that if you've been guilty of chasing traffic in the past, like many of us have and like I did for years, you've got to stop doing that. Instead, focus and start measuring your average Vista value. The most important number to your business, if you want to survive long term, 
it all comes down to that one number. Okay, so start improving it. If you've ever wondered, what do the top earners do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, this is what they're doing. They're measuring this number and they're constantly improving it. So instead of buying a course on how to get more traffic and spending 90% of your time going through all these different courses, trying to learn the next latest and greatest traffic generation strategy, focus on this instead. If you focus on traffic, getting traffic and not this, you, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Uh, track all of your traffic. Track it right down to the ad. So I've just showed you how to do that. So from now on, every time you do a link, go to Google URL Builder and actually put in your details, get a link with the code on the end, and then every time you do a link, use that link. Now you will know where your sales are coming from and where they're not. Once you know where your sales are coming from, well then that's, you know, you can invest more money in those ads, starve the ponies and feed the stallions. Last of all, you've got to approach your business like the Wright brothers approached building a plane. They focused on the aircraft first. Once they had something that could fly or that could glide, then they thought about adding power in the form of an engine. So you focus on your website first, maximizing your average Vista value and measuring it, constantly improving it, and then you go in search of traffic. Don't be like Langley. Langley focused on the engine, so he built this great engine that was very powerful. He put it on a substandard aircraft that couldn't fly. What happened? It crashed. That's what most people in our industry do. They focus on the traffic, the engine, they put it on their, they send it to their, their website and they wonder why they're not getting results. And that's exactly why. So guys, that's about it. I, I hope you've learned something. Um, a question? Yeah. Thanks. Oh! Thanks. Thank you. Now that was funny. I don't know, guys. Was there anything there to learn? <laughs> Matt, that was phenomenal, my friend. Thanks. Pure gold. Thank you so much, Thanks. partner. Seriously. Thanks. Thank you so much. It was, uh, we're very fortunate to have him here sharing all that knowledge. That is pure gold. Thanks. So rock on, buddy. Thanks, man.